Thank you. Thank you, Ro, very much. And, and uh, thank you, Renee and Tammy. And thank you, Florida Atlantic University and Lifelong Learning. Um, it's a wonderful pleasure to be here. As Ro mentioned, I lived in this area for 30 years. My daughter grew up here, and now she and her husband and my grandson, who's four and a half years old, run a local organic food uh, gourmet local organic food restaurant on a little island off the coast of Seattle, Bainbridge Island. So my wife and I moved there too. Um, tonight we're going to talk about hoodwinked, what's wrong with our economy and how to fix it. But before we get into that, uh, I'd just like to say that we are at a time in history that's truly revolutionary. And I think it's important for all of us to understand that we were born into this time for a reason, you and I. We are born into this amazing time for a reason. And I want to talk more about that later on, what your role is in this. I think this time in history is more important than any revolution that we've ever gone through before. It's more important than the agricultural revolution or the industrial revolution. It's more important than the American Revolution or the French Revolution. This is a time in history like none other. And incidentally, every indigenous culture I've worked with, and over the years I've worked with indigenous cultures on every single continent where they exist, that doesn't include Antarctica, <laughs> but every one of them prophesizes that this would be a time, and is a time, for the potential for vast human change on this planet. And we're in it. You're in it. We're all feeling it. It's happening. These are indeed revolutionary times. And as one example, for the first time in human history, every one of us, every human being on this planet, in fact, every sentient being on this planet, is faced with the same crises. This has never happened before. Florida had hurricanes. San Francisco had earthquakes. Asia had tsunamis. They didn't really impact anybody else around the world all that much. But today, every single one of us, every life form on this planet, is threatened by crises that include global climate chaos. The glaciers are melting. The oceans are rising. We see it. We see it here in Florida. We see it in the Andes. We see it in the Himalayas, the glaciers. For the first time in history, our resources are declining at increasing rates. And the prices of food and fuel and other essentials are increasing at accelerating rates. Species are going extinct at phenomenal rates. We're being overpopulated. We're all experiencing this, every sentient being on this planet. And for the first time in human history, we're all talking to each other through the internet, streaming, I was just on a radio program this morning by telephone from here in my hotel in, in Jupiter. And it was this fairly small localized radio station. It, it reached a number of sta stations in Maine that was out of Maine. But they were streaming it to the Philippines. People were streaming in questions from Indonesia and South Africa. It's amazing. A couple of years ago, I was up in the Himalayas in Tibet. I was up at about 17,000 feet, and incidentally, I've got to apologize, I'm having a tough time because I usually wander around the stage, I like to wander when I'm talking, but the C-SPAN doesn't, doesn't go for that, so I'm holding my own here. <laughs> Thank you, C-SPAN. Getting a little fidgety. Um, so I'm up at 17,000 feet on the, in the Himalayas, and I'm talking to the nomadic tribal chieftain who's living in this black tent there, and he's lamenting the fact that his people will never have telephones because the lines can't reach there. And I hear the same thing deep in the Amazon. I spend a lot of time in the Amazon. And last week, I talked to this tribal chieftain by telephone. <laughs> cellular, he, he has a cellular satellite phone. And they have them deep in the Andes, too. We're all talking to each other. For the first time in human history, this is amazingly significant. For the first time in human history, we're, we're all facing the same crisis and we're all sharing the information. For the first time in human history, we've really got it. My four and a half year old grandson, whose name is Grant, and he lives near me on this island off the coast of Washington, and I walk with him in the forest. And every time I walk with this little boy, 
I think, what is this world going to look like in six decades when he's my age? And we all know that if we stay this course, it's going to be ugly. But we, you, and I have the opportunity to change it for Grant. And we also have to realize that for the first time in human history, the only way Grant can hope to grow up in a sustainable, just, peaceful world, in a world that's thriving for all sentient beings, is if every child on this planet, every child born in Bolivia, every child born in Botswana, in Palestine and Israel, grows up in a sane world, a sustainable world, a just world. This has never happened before. We used to have to just worry about Florida, maybe the United States, but we didn't have to worry about the rest of the world. Today, for the first time in human history, we know that we are living on a very, very fragile space station. But unlike the space station our astronauts built, this one doesn't have any shuttles. You can't get off. And Grant's not going to be able to get off. We've got to fix it. We have to take care of it. And what a wonderful opportunity. We're living in these amazing revolutionary times. This is truly the most revolutionary time in human history. I absolutely believe that. And as a young boy growing up in New Hampshire, I come from over 300 years of Yankee Calvinists, as Roe mentioned, Puritans. <clears throat> My ancestors fought in the revolution in every major war since. And I was a great student of history. And I used to wish that I'd been born in the 1700s. So I could have fought in that revolutionary war too. What I get now is this is a bigger one. This is a more important revolution. This is a better time to be a revolutionary and we don't have to take guns to do it. I'll talk about that in a moment. This is the revolution, bigger than that one. It's global and it's an awful lot more comfortable too. We don't have to go out to the outhouse. <laughs> so here we are in these times. And what we've also come to realize is that the global economy that we've created, the world that we have created, is a failure. We have been hoodwinked. And our economy is a failure. And we don't want it to go back to normal. Because normal is a world where less than 5% of us who live in the United States consume more than 30% of the world's resources, while half the world's starving or on the verge of starvation. That is not a world that Grant wants to grow up in. It's not a world any of us want to pass on to our children or grandchildren. It's not a model. It's a failed system. Less than 5% of the world's population consuming 30% of the world's resources. You cannot repeat that in China or India Africa, Latin America, these places may want to replicate it, but they can't. The numbers don't add up. We need another five planets just like this one without any human beings to make it happen. It ain't going to happen. It's a failed economic model. And we must realize that, and we must change it. This economic model, though, is one that's based on something else that's brand new in history, and that is if you look back a few hundred years at global politics, geopolitics, uh, you look at a place where a, 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 an earth that was basically driven by religious organizations. And then later we get the countries, governments took control, and some were totalitarian, some were republics, some were dem democracies. But now we've moved into a time where the big corporations have taken control. This is a new era. And the big corporations are the ones that are calling the shots. Uh, no politician gets elected to a major post in the United States or any other of the so-called democracies without huge amounts of corporate financing and support. Obama has made that very clear to us. And even if a politician were to get elected that way, let's say Ron Paul doesn't take any money from the, the big corporations, and let's say he got elected. It's a long shot. But let's just assume that happened. He'd still have to face a Congress that's filled with people who are totally at the mercy of big corporations totally owe their souls to the big corporations. He'd still have to face 35,000 uh, corporate lobbyists who are in Washington, D.C. right now. And he would have to face the fact that the President of the United States is extremely vulnerable. Extremely vulnerable. In Kennedy's day, you could have affairs with Marilyn Monroe, Kennedy could, and lots of other starlets, and big deal. And in Clinton's time, we learned that 